follow along with us today, turn to the book of Hebrews. That's the Bible, the book of the Bible that teaches us that the men should make the coffee. Hebrews. <laughs> I love dad jokes. We are thankful to be here, thankful to be saved. We are thankful for all the testimonies today. You know, you might think that your testimony, you say, well, I don't know what I'm going to say, and or what I say might sound stupid. Let me tell you something. Sometimes your testimony is the very thing I need to hear. That's right. And it's the very thing that someone else needs to hear. It, right. it lifts us up to hear from each other. Uh, Hebrews 12 is where we'll be. Before we get started, we'll open up with a word of prayer. Father, uh, please bless us now in your word, God. We pray, Lord, use it to help each one of us here, God, today, your children. And Lord, we want to pray most of all that if there be one here today that is unsaved, God, they would come to you, calling out to you, believing in your Son. We ask it all in his name, and amen. Hebrews 12 going to be some very familiar scripture. Um, there's many examples in the Word of God, many uh, comparisons in the Word of God to what the Christian life is like. And in many cases, the Bible uses references of athletics and compares it to the Christian life. If we were to look at Ephesians 6, when it speaks of our struggle in spiritual warfare, it talks of wrestling. Many times throughout Scripture, uh, we are talking of going on a journey. Other times in Scripture, just like in this particular uh, verses that we're going to look at here, we are speaking about running a race. Now, if we are running a race, which we are, uh, what is the goal? Well, the goal is heaven, right? The goal is to be with Jesus forever. And that's what we want to talk about today. We want to look at encouragement for reaching the goal line. Because as we look at the world today, there are many things that can get a person discouraged. Many things in this uh, world that can get you down in the dumps spiritually. As a matter of fact, when we look at the third verse of Hebrews 12, the writer here says, For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself. Now notice here, it says here, and of course it's speaking of Jesus, it says that we are to consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners. What the Bible is telling us here is that Jesus had sinners that was contradicting him, that was standing up to him and saying that he was telling falsehoods and trying to get him to be quiet. If it happened to the Lord... Guess who else is going to happen to right, It's going to happen to us. And so he says, look to him. And then he says this, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. The mind is a place where Satan likes to attack. Likes to get you thinking, likes to get you wore out, likes to get you discouraged. And if there was ever a time for people to get discouraged, about the things that are happening in the world is certainly the year 2020. And I have a bad feeling that 2021 isn't going to get a whole lot better, to be quite honest with you. I'm not a pessimist, I'm a realist. And that's just simply the way I see things unfolding. But knowing that, you know, when we look throughout the Word of God, there are many places in the Bible that we could consider pregame pep talks since we are on the subject of athletics, or a halftime uh, pep talk, or a between-the-round instructions, if you will. Uh, I like boxing as an analogy for life. Boxing, I think, is a, a beautiful sport, and there is a lot to be learned about life from the sport of boxing. Um, so as we look at this, we are going to look at the first and second verse of Hebrews 12, and this is a pep talk. This is between the round instruction because the simple truth is this, is that there will be times of struggle, there will be times of difficulty, there will be times, if you have already not experienced them, in your journey, in your race, in your marathon to reach the goal line, there will be times that you will be tempted and you will think about laying the cross down and walking away. Satan will plant that in your mind. You'll see the discouraging uh, things that are happening outside in the world. And Satan will come to you and he'll say, do you even believe all this? 
Just go ahead and stop. Go ahead and lay it down. Go ahead and quit. Because, well, the rest of the world, you're outnumbered in the church. The rest of the world, they've moved on to higher thinking. They've moved on to other things. So you just go ahead and quit because all of this isn't even real. Look at the way the world's going, Satan might say. But when we look into this little pep talk here, when we look into what God told the writer to pin down, in the very first verse, the Bible says this, Wherefore, seeing, we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. You know, if you are discouraged today, if you are seeing the things that are happening in the world, the things that are happening on college campuses, the way that Christians are being treated in the world, let me emphasize that. It's the way that Christians are being treated in the world. Yeah. The false religions of the world are not being treated the way the people of God are being treated today. Right. They're not being killed all around the world the way Christians are. And in our country, they are not mocked. They are not scorned. They're not made fun of the way that Christians are in <laughs> our country. You see, as we look at this world, and I agree with Tim, I agree with Mary 100%. Things are winding down. Things are getting worse. We are at the doors of things. I don't know how all of it's going to play out, but I do know this. I do know that I know whom I have believed right. and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Amen. They might come to the doors of the church, Mary. They might stand there and they might say, you're not going to preach the Word of God anymore. I got news for them. I'm going to preach the Word of God Amen. some more. Amen. The doors of this church will not close again as long as I am the pastor here. Amen. Now, moving on from all of that, though, you see, uh, there is a, a persecution happening. There is a movement happening and Satan's getting stronger and people get discouraged. The Bible here says, look at this cloud of witnesses yeah. that you have around you. Now, the writer here is no doubt referring back to the previous chapter, which is the 11th chapter of Hebrews, otherwise known as the faith chapter. And we look at all this and we think of it in comparison to what we see in our world today. Because you see, in our world today, something is going to happen in our nation. And I don't know what it is. It almost looks like civil war, just to be quite frank with you. Because you see, once upon a time in politics, we had disagreements in politics. We have come to a place now where we no longer have small disagreements. We have two completely different worldviews on things. And the two worldviews that are being promoted, they cannot coexist. It's impossible. Life and death cannot coexist. Righteousness and sin cannot coexist. Socialism and capitalism cannot coexist. Lawlessness with law cannot coexist. There are two completely opposite things that are happening. And as these things are happening, as we said, we see a push against Christianity from the side that is pro-abortion, from the side that is pro-socialism, from the side that is completely godless and completely law lawless. Uh, you know, I, I wasn't 100% planning on saying this today, but it, it's a thought that has come into my mind, so I'm just going to spit it out there. Uh, one of our Supreme Court justices passed, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and everyone seems to be up in arms about that. And I'm going to be honest with you, I don't know why. She was a completely godless heathen. Right. That's just a simple fact. She was a feminist that opposed traditional marriage, the way that God had things set up, and she was pro-choice. She was for abortion 100%. We didn't lose a lot. Right. I'm just going to be completely honest with you. And we see all of these things happening, and we see this movement to try to get tell people, and it, it, it's all over the place. It has even made it into our area. I have family. I have family who try to question the Word of God. Say, well, maybe this isn't the only way, or maybe it isn't even true. And the writer here says, go back and look at this great cloud around you. You know, we go back and we look at these people, what we would call heroes of faith. <clears throat> Noah, who heard the word of God, and who built the ark, and who preached. And he and his family were saved. Abraham and Sarah, who was given a promise. 
And they carried through. Now, don't forget, we talked a little bit about some of these people uh, Wednesday evening in the message. And all of these people had faults in their life. But God's grace, God's mercy, God's goodness, and God's faithfulness to them showed that following him is always the right way to go. We go on down through here. We see Isaac and Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Joshua, Rahab, on and on and on. We could go and we could look back through these Old Testament saints who looked to a time when a Savior would come. You and I look back and we know that the Savior has came, that he was born of a virgin that he died on the cross, that he was buried, and that he was resurrected. And we look forward to a time when he is coming back. I don't know when he's coming back. I just know he is coming back. And the Bible says to be ready for your Lord is going to come in an hour you think not. Amen. So that means no one, none of us That's know. Right, none of us know, but he is coming back. So the writer here says, look back to all of this. And for you and I today, you know, one of the, one of the, most prevalent things that I, I see happening is that there are people that are saying, well, you know, all of this is just made up. All of it's fake. Let's think about that from a logical standpoint just for a moment, and let's just look at the apostles. What did the apostles have to gain from making up a lie and following it? They all died by the hands of people with the exception of the Apostle John, which history states he was boiled in oil before being exiled to the Isle of Patmos where he wrote the book of Revelation. Peter was afraid of those men that later on in the book of Acts he stood up to and he said, it was you who crucified the Lord of glory, but God raised him from the dead. Now what happened to the Apostle Peter in between the time that he ran and cursed the Lord and said, I don't know him, to the time that he would stand before those very men that he was afraid of? He seen a resurrected Savior. Peter gained nothing. Peter didn't gain riches or anything from following the Lord. But he followed it because he knew it was the truth Amen. as well as all the other disciples, Amen. all the other apostles. You look at Paul. Paul left a life of being popular. Paul left a life of being looked up to. Paul left a life of probably somewhat ease in his life. There probably wasn't a lot that he had to worry about. And he walked away from that to follow the risen Savior. He walked away from that to a life where he would be shipwrecked, to a life where he would be beaten, to a life where he would be stoned, to a life where he would eventually be beheaded. And it was his words that we quoted just a little while ago. At the end of the apostle's life, his last writings to Timothy, I know whom I have believed. The apostle was persuaded, and he kept on going. The writer here says, look at this great cloud of witnesses. You know, in the world today, we have so many false preachers, so many false prophets in the world who are, are just simply in the church business, and it's just that. It's a business. The original apostles, they weren't rich men. No. They had nothing to gain except they wanted to simply follow the truth. And they wanted eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. But you know, I thought about that and I thought, you know, look at the cloud of witnesses around us today. I thought about the older saints that we have in the churches all around us. You know, they've all been through things that you and I have been through and probably worse as life has went on. And yet they have stayed the course. Why have they stayed the course? Because God has been faithful to them in their life. One of the men that, that really stick out to me was Brother Larry Wells, a man that I misjudged when I first took pastor here, a man that would be one of my greatest encouragers and someone that I would admire super, super greatly. When I look to his life, I see a man that was, as in his own words, sold out for the Lord. And he knew where he was going, and he knew that this was the right way. Um, I remember one time he told me, well, I don't remember where we was, but he told me, Brother Larry had a very bad heart. And he looked at me and he said, I told the wife, if she finds me, you better wait till I'm good and gone before you call anybody. He was ready to go home. That's a man that knows where he's going. That isn't a man that thinks he knows where he's going. That isn't a man that hopes he knows where he's going. That was a man that knew where he was going. 
Amen. That is the cloud of witnesses that we have about us. All these old saints that we can think of throughout the years. We've heard their testimonies. We've seen their praise. We've seen their faithfulness. So the writer here says, look. Look at this great cloud of witnesses. Since you have the great cloud of witnesses, he goes on now to give us some instruction. He started out with a little bit of encouragement. Now he's starting out with some instruction. Because as we said... We want to make it to the goal line. We want to cross the finish line. We want to come to the end of it all and say, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. So there is some instruction for us on how to better help us. You know, as we go along in this life, the Word of God is, God did not leave us without instruction on these things. So he tells us this. He says, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. Now listen to what he says. Let us run with patience the race that is set before us. So he's using the picture here of someone running a race. And he gives the advice, let us lay aside every weight and the sin. Two separate things there. Two separate things. Obviously, we know what sin is, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. It's, it's very well easily lined out in Scripture. But the weight, he says, which does so easily beset us. Now, I am not a runner. I've never been a runner. I don't want to be a runner. <laughs> just don't. I used to love to run on the basketball court. But that, to me, that had a purpose behind it. I'm not an endurance person. Just to, just to run and run and run. Uh, I'm more of an anaerobic type of person. I can sprint real fast. If you need something done fast, if you need a heavy load moved a short distance or you need something done fast, I'm your guy. If you want someone to keep running and running and running and running, I'm not your guy. Not your guy. But we have some runners here. We have some people who ran. And I know a little bit at least about it. I know that you're not going to want to have anything bogging you down. Especially if you're doing a marathon. And let's be honest. We don't know when the Lord is coming back. But this is a little bit like a marathon. It's a little bit like a marathon. We are called to have endurance in this. And so when you see people who are running. Usually their shorts are very uh, lightweight kind of shorts. They're made of material that are lightweight. They're usually pretty short shorts. Because you don't want the extra material. Uh, they usually have on a shirt that is, is very lightweight as well. Again, you don't want extra material. You don't want anything weighing you down. Running shoes are also designed to be very light shoes as well. Why? Well, because if you're running a marathon, do you want to be carrying any extra weight? Absolutely not. That is, is even if you're running a short distance, you don't want extra weight. It, 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 it's counterproductive to what you're trying to do. Our goal is heaven. Our goal is to be with Jesus. Our goal is to rejoice with each other for eternity. And we don't want anything slowing us down. We want to be encouraged and we want to keep moving forward. So he says, lay aside every weight. So what is the weight here that he's talking about? Well, he already said sin and we're going to deal with that in just a moment. So perhaps the weight is those areas that perhaps are not so black and white. Those things that may in and of themselves may not be sin per se, but can become something that can weigh you down. And what I mean by that is this. Anything in my life, anything in your life, that becomes a hindrance in our relationship to the Lord is a weight. Anything that keeps us from being in the Word. Anything that keeps us from giving to the house of God. Anything that slows us up, takes our mind uh, too far away from the Lord. Those things become a weight to us. Listen, uh, the, the old expression is that... The Christian life is, is like having two wolves living inside of you. And, and the one that wins is the one that you feed the most. 
You want to feed the Christian side of you more because we are told in Scripture that we have two uh, natures battling within ourselves. And the nature that you feed the most, that is the nature that it, without question is going to be the strongest. Yeah. And so you want to get rid of the things that weigh you down. And my goodness, I could make a whole huge list because like we said, this isn't something necessarily that is, is brought out in black and white as sin. And I'll just name, I was thinking of a list and, and I'll just name some things I didn't write anything down. But I thought, you know, work. Work can be a weight upon you. Now you say, well, now, wait a minute, I've got to make money. I've got to attend work when my employer says so. I, I agree. I understand. But some people have in their minds that they must promote themselves and they must advance themselves at work, and the job becomes so important to them and they spend so much time there that it is a drag and it is a weight on them spiritually. You know what? Something as simple as music can be a weight upon you. I've talked about music that I had to get rid of and stop listening to in my music collection. Um, video games can be a weight upon you. Something as simple as a hobby that you have can become a weight if it is something that is overtaking you, if it is something that gives, uh, that you put more time and invest more time into than your spiritual life. Listen, I, I've said before, and I firmly believe this, I think God wants us to enjoy life as much as we can. And there are without things, uh, without a doubt things that God has placed in life for us to enjoy, hobbies and, and many wonderful things, but they cannot become a weight to us. They are not meant to do, become a weight to us. Right. You know, shopping, shopping can become a weight. You say, well, how can that become a weight? A lot of times we spend money we don't have uh, to buy things we don't need to impress people we don't even like. That can become a weight to us, and we get in debt, and it brings us down, and it bogs us down. Then you have to work more to get more money to pay the bills because you bought things you didn't need. Uh, on and on and on we could go about so many different things. It, it, it's... It's personal, it's, uh, again, it's the gray issues, we would say. Now he goes on, though, to talk about black and white issues. Only you know the weight that would bog you down, only I know the weight that would bog me down. And he also tells us to lay aside the sin, which does so easily beset us. Listen, all of us here, if you've spent any time on this journey, You've probably already learned what your weakness is, what you fall prey to as far as sin goes. Uh, listen, stay far, far away from it. Do not get close to it. There is only a certain amount of time, and this is a, a simple example. There is only a certain amount of time that you will be able to play with fire before you get burned. You will get burned, I promise you. It will happen. And listen, there is only so close you can get to sin before it will grab you. You see, Satan will, Satan will dangle it in front of you, your weakness, and you'll get so close to it and you won't fall. And you'll say, well, see, I handled this pretty good. And then he'll let you get a little closer next time before he, he really goes at you. Because remember the old saying that I have, this thing isn't, isn't checkers, it's chess. And, and he'll continue to do that and then finally, you see, he'll burn you. Stay far away from it. I love the story of Joseph when Potiphar's wife grabbed him and said, lie with me. And he ran. He ran. Do you think that was easy for Joseph? I don't think it was. I think Potiphar's wife was probably a pretty nice looking woman. And Joseph was a young man as well. But he got out of there. You've got to stay away from it because those things will weigh you down. So we've had a little bit of Encouragement, a little bit of instruction. Now, finally, we're going to close with some encouragement. And I really love this verse. I've never understood this verse the way I do now until I've studied for it this time. So knowing all of that, knowing we've got this huge cloud of witnesses, that when the world tells you this stuff isn't even real, there's nothing to it, just lay it down, just forget it, we've got the cloud of witnesses around us. We are told to lay aside the weights and the sin that 
gets us tripped up, that messes us up, so that we can run with patience the race that is set before us. Now it tells us this, looking unto Jesus. When we look at Jesus, what do we see? There's many, many different things that we can say we see when we look at the Lord, but two of the most resounding things that jump out in my mind is love and mercy. Love and mercy. And I love the picture that Revelation chapter 1 paints because it's the Lord in all of His glory revealed to John. And remember, John is the one that laid his head on Jesus' chest at the Last Supper. And Jesus in all of his glory was presented before John. And John says, I fell at his feet as one who were dead. And here's why I love this. Here's Jesus in all of his power, all of his glory. A sight that John couldn't even take. He fell down as though he were dead. And, and here's the beauty of it. Jesus said, John said, he laid his hand upon me and said, fear not. I am the first and the last. Amen. Looking unto Jesus, the one that loves us. Listen, we are his children. He loves us. Listen to me, Dave. If you're here and you're unsaved, he loves you too. He wants to save you. As a matter of fact, that was his whole purpose for coming. It says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher. The author and finisher of our faith. Now, stop and think about that for just a moment. The author of it all. God incarnate in the flesh is what His Son is, is what the Lord Jesus is. The creator of everything, the Bible tells us in the book of John, it says these words in the first chapter, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Now listen to this, speaking of Jesus, All things were made by Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. Now, why is that important? It's important because of this. It said He's the author and finisher of our faith. In other words, He knew what we would be and what the cost would be in order to save us. He knew that Calvary was His destination in order to give mankind hope. And He chose that path. He chose that path for all people. The Bible tells us this, and I'm not going to be much longer. Who for the joy that was set before him. So the Bible says that there was joy set before the Son of God. What was the joy? Let's find out. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Was the cross joyful? I don't think it was. Six hours in agony. The last three hours, not only in physical agony, but in a spiritual and mental agony that none of us will ever grasp or understand. Mm -hmm. We read out of Isaiah 52, uh, it's been recently we've preached out of Isaiah 52, and we talked about how the Bible says his visage or his appearance was so marred more than any other man. And then we went to Matthew 27, I believe it was, where the Bible tells us that now from the sixth hour into the ninth hour there was darkness over all the land. I think that's when Isaiah 52 was fulfilled. I think that God poured out His wrath upon His Son. I can't imagine how He did that. Amen. I can't imagine how Jesus knew from the beginning that this would be the way. So there was no joy in the cross. No, the cross was humiliating. The cross was that that was the whole purpose of it. It was to humiliate the one that would be there so that the crowd would take notice and it would get the people who was thinking about committing crimes, it would keep them in line because they would say, there ain't no way I want to go there and go through that. That was the whole purpose behind it. And here is the one who has all of this glory in Revelation chapter 1, who shined like lightning, the Bible says, he said, I will go to the cross. The joy was not in the cross. And here's the thing about it. The Bible says in the next uh, section, despising the shame. Now that word despising is a little bit tricky unless you look it up in the Greek. It means thinking little of. In other words, Jesus thought little of the shame. Why did he think little of the shame? Because there was a joy that was set before him. What was the joy that was set before him? We already said it wasn't the cross. It wasn't the scourging. It wasn't being separated from the Father. So what was the joy that was set before him? It was to be able to save you and me. And bring us 
to Him one day. Amen. The goal line. Jesus said in John chapter 14, He said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto Myself. That, and here's what makes heaven heaven, that where I am, there you may be also. Amen. That's the goal line. Amen. Listen to me today, friend. I, if you are discouraged, look unto Him. Look around you at the, the vast testimonies around you. If you're here today and you're lost, we invite you to come to Him. I don't know if there's anyone here today that is unsaved as we ask Sister Mildred to come, but listen to me. Christ chose the cross, thought little of the shame that was before Him. There was great shame there, don't get me wrong. But he thought so little of it. Why? Because the goal was to be able to save us. The goal was to be able to bring us to him. He says, look unto him, the author and finisher of our faith. As we stand.